believe that God can come summeringly and do something beyond the human mouth and a body, it's not Christianity. God will always come in an earthen vessel. That's why he's misunderstood. Our God is broken on the cross, dying to show his humanity. And so when you're talking in tongues, he uses you because you're yielded to pray even for your enemies. So when you yield your prayer to God, he uses your tongue to pray for those you don't even know or don't even care for, but he dreams for. And therefore, tongues are given to you so that you pray the mysteries of God. Are you ready for an amazing word? We're going to go into tongue talking, the prayers of Paul, and how it's going to change and rock your life. Come on, give it up for Kay. <laughs> Sunday morning service. This is Wildlife Church. This message is going to be awesome. It's going to change your life. Trust me, this message is going to go deep into your soul and it's going to impact and affect everything you touch in the name of Jesus. Take a seat. Okay, guys, um, welcome to uh, Wow Sunday. This is a communion Sunday, so please stay, take communion. Uh, also, wait for the prayer line because the prayer line is really awesome. If you need healing, then make sure that you come to me and there'll be Therese, I don't know where Therese is, yeah, Therese, Therese and Fiona with me who will pray for you, okay, and we're really believing that there will be a shift and a change. There are many, many testimonies, uh, maybe next time we're going to have a string of testimonies coming in for people who get healed in the prayer line. How many of you here sitting here have been in the prayer line but actually seen, actually, um, actually sensed a change and a shift when you were in the prayer line? Just raise your hand, can you see, you can see it right here, you see? So these are people in the prayer line who was, whose life shifted, they got healed, okay? I think Carlene was here, she wanted to give a testimony. Where is she? Is she not, oh, she, oh, she's inside? Okay, yeah. So, but I won't get the testimonies today, but maybe next Sunday I'm going to get testimonies for you. But today is a very, very special message. And it starts with, the, with uh, ending off, maybe Tuesday, I'm going to continue in this. Okay, it ends off with the Paul's of uh, the, the prayers of the Paul's of prayer. Uh, the, 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 the prayer of Paul, okay? So I'm just going to read a bit of that just for uh, the beginning, for you to understand why I'm saying that this aspect is probably one of, uh, one of Paul's greatest prayers, okay? Now, we are looking at some of his prayers, and we've only done Ephesians, there is Colossians, there's so many different prayers, but we will, we will end with this one, but I want you to know, this is how Paul prayed most of the time, and so I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians uh, 14, or 12 actually, to show you something. You guys are very, very quiet, okay? So, yeah, I hope it gets better, okay? Okay, um, okay. So, let's see. Sorry, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18. Now see, I want you to see this, okay? Verse 18. I thank my God, for I speak with tongues more than you. Come and say it out loud. I speak with tongues. I thank God. He says, I thank God. There is something to be thankful for. Okay? I thank God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Wow. Could that be your story? If you are, are you a man of prayer? Okay? And is this your story? It doesn't have to be. Okay? Yet in the church, I would rather speak with five words with my understanding. Did you just get that? Okay. So people come to our life church and say, well, you don't speak in tongues. I said, no, we do speak in tongues. In fact, we speak in tongues more than you all. Come on. Huh. Did you just get it? Okay. So don't ever think we don't speak in tongues. Of course, I speak in tongues. Right. But I'd rather speak with my own understanding at church. Did you just get it? It's just simple understanding of the Bible because... He explains this, okay? So can we agree together, church, that tongues was probably, not even probably, according to this, Paul's main prayer life? Yeah. 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 Can we say that? Can yeah. we, do, do we agree yeah. that tongues is Paul's, he, Paul's main prayer life? Yeah. Now we pray, okay? And we go to church, we sometimes only pray in church, sometimes we pray when we have a, have a problem. But this guy says that he doesn't pray in church. Okay. It's very interesting. But his prayer is at home, but it's in tongues. 
just get it, okay? Now, do I pray in church? Yes, of course I pray in church, but not much. So we'll say, people come to our life church, do these guys even pray? Do you even pray, bro? (laughs) (laughs) Of course we pray. In fact, we might pray more than you all. But not in a language that you understand. When I come here, I rather speak with a language that you understand. Do you just get it? Okay? So now, this is important because it shows you that you need to have a prayer life. And a prayer life at home will get exhausted if you try to pray in your own language. How many of you try to pray more than 10 minutes in your own language? You understand that? Because praying in your own language or in English or in Sinhalese becomes quite hard. You understand that? And therefore, there's an aspect in the New Testament, and you think it's New Testament, uh, because someone said that they all speak, started speaking in tongues in the New Testament, but that's not so. Okay? It was, it, was, it was revealed in the New Testament when the Holy Spirit was poured out. But it wasn't the first time. You just get it. Because he said, this is what the prophet Joel says. You see, when he was poured out on the day of Pentecost, it wasn't the first time. Because it's, they said, what is this? He said, this is what prophet Joel is talking about. Remember? So he said, oh, this happened. And I'm going to say where it happened. It happened. Really, it started happening. And if you read it properly, and this is what people, if you do the proper research, okay, my background, just to give you a, a background, before I came into Christianity was, was Hebraic. Let's put it like that. I won't go into, I won't mention the name, what it is. Anyone who has a mystical understanding, will understand when I say it was Hebraic. It was Hebraic. So you see, so it was rabbonic teachings. Rabbonic teaching means they don't, they still not got Christ, but it's deep rabbonic, okay? So they understood tongues, and the Old Testament talks about it, about line upon line, word upon word, but God will speak to you in another language, okay? And they understood that there was something called tongues, and in fact, when they were invited up the mountain, when the law was given, the initial aspect when he said was lightning and thundering, that word lightning and thundering, if you look at the, the Hebraic translation, it means tongues of fire, that's what it means. Tongues of fire, okay? Tongues of fire. And that tongues of fire, God first initially wanted them to be able to connect with them beyond their language of English. Okay? So let, let me just give you a simple context to this so you have um, a, a better reasoning on uh, abilities. You see, you go back to, um, uh, to Genesis and you have this amazing uh, um, story of the... Tower of Babel. How many of you have heard of the Tower of Babel? It's a famous story, yeah? It's a famous story where there's a tower being built. And when you say tower, if you look at it, really, it's a pyramid, okay? And they're building a pyramid. Now, this is all in the days of Nero. It's a really great story, okay? We don't understand. We're talking about 8,000 years. And we're going back. And we see this tower, this pyramid is being built. And they're trying to get somewhere. As you know, people build pyramids to try and get to the highest pinnacle, okay? And so they try to connect with God, building this pyramid. Interestingly, I won't go into the details of it. It's a very, very mystical story, okay? I've got my own thoughts about what really happened there. But what happened was, in, interestingly, that until then, no one was speaking a language that was known to one species. That's what you need to get. So you're going back thousands and thousands of years into Egypt. Now, you know that Egypt is extremely mystical, and you realize that... These people who are building these pyramids, okay? There's a lot of that stuff out there now on all the, the channels, and it's coming up on, on History Channel, and it's coming up on all the, all the, forget about the New Age channels, even the scientific channels. And these people who are building the pyramids long, long time ago, okay? It looks like the original guys who built the pyramid didn't have a language. That's what you need to understand. And somehow they were able to communicate with each other. According to this story, it's a thousand and thousand year old story, okay? It's, it, they did not communicate with language. And in fact, it was a downgrade so that they could not complete the pyramids, okay? A downgrade was given when they had to com- communicate with language. Okay, so you understand how limited words are. Sometimes you're trying to tell people you love them or you're t- trying to tell people how you feel about them and you realize how limited the English language is. Like, English is probably the most limited language. We, in fact, in these parts of the world, have Sanskrit and Pali, who are a much more sophisticated language. And then the Hebra- he- Hebrews have the Jewish language, because the Jewish language is amazing, because when you're given one letter, you're, it's a number, and it's a symbol. So just understand, when you're talking in, in English like this, you're, you're, you're saying the word cat, and C-A-T, cat, is 
a, a cat and you have, an, you have a picture for it, right? But they had, for every letter, they had a number. So it was numerical. So when you talk about language, they understood language to be numerical. So when there's a C, there was a, there was a number to that C, okay? And it had to add up. So when they make a, made a sentence, it had to be C, it had, had to mean some number that will represent something else. You see? So when they pull a, a string of sentences down, it will be, in, they count all the numbers, and it makes one formula, one mathematical number. And so if, when they're talking, if it doesn't correspond with maths, it doesn't make any sense to them. Do you understand what kind of level these guys were on? And that's how they started forming the old languages. When it comes down to English, I mean, it's a new language. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's, it's so poor. Do you understand that? But, so these guys are coming from a place of understanding a place of no language, then coming down to a place of language and restriction, okay? So, God wants to communicate with you beyond your senses and beyond your mind, because your mind and your senses restrict you. So, in the New Testament, they reveal that there is an aspect of God that, can, that you, someone can connect with beyond his normal English language. Now, this is a very mystical concept, but in the New Testament church, it is not mystical. It is just a normal thing. You go to any Pentecostal church, if you go to one of my village churches, these guys are jabbering off in tongues, okay? And then they have crazy stuff happening as well. That is why an uneducated man who doesn't have any qualifications can suddenly have certain powers. And you're wondering, how does this pastor, how does he have powers? But if you watch his prayer life, he's praying in tongues. Okay? Now, he doesn't know what he's doing, but that's the, that's the whole thing. He's not supposed to know what he's doing. Because it's supposed to be a mystery. Now, but we'll get to parts of this mystery being revealed. Okay? And this was, tongues was important because on the day of Pentecost, this was one of the greatest aspects that people saw. That on the day of Pentecost, they started, they were Jews, and they started speaking in an unknown language, and they said, the Holy Spirit is here, and as they started speaking in this unknown language, people started interpreting it in their own language. I won't go there, okay, it's, it's a very, there's a, there's a whole lot of teachings on this that I won't go there. I just want to focus on a few aspects of why you might want to pray in tongues when you are alone. I remember when I started praying in tongues initially, I was embarrassed to pray in tongues in front of my wife, and that's okay, okay, and fear now was the same. If you want to pray in tongues in front of me, okay? It was like weird, like, what are we doing, you know? All right, so we don't want to look like a fool, isn't it? Because it's like, what are you doing? What are you talking, okay? But we learned later on that there were benefits of, of group tongues when there are believers. I won't do it in church today, okay? Because there are people who are still not believers. You just get it, okay? But if you hear me praying when I'm worshiping or whatever, there's a bit of tongues that come. Okay, it comes automatically. Okay, and some of you, how many of you pray in tongues here? Just raise up your hand, okay? Okay, you see, right? Okay, some, if you don't pray in tongues, don't worry because there's this scripture. I'm gonna give you a scripture for you to not pray in tongues as well. Okay, so you don't have to, you don't have to feel uncomfortable. Verse chapter 12, verse one. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers. Well, verse one. I do not want you to be ignorant. Listen carefully. Then he goes on a whole little thing about spiritual gifts. Verse, 30, verse 29, 30. Do all have gifts of healing? 30. It says, do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire spiritual gifts. So he says, it's not everybody's cup of tea. And that's okay. But it might be somebody's cup of tea. Okay? And then in a Pentecostal charismatic church, which we are, though I, I can only knock them because I am, okay? You can knock what you are, right? <laughs> okay, so in that type of setting, when someone does speak in tongues, then we need to say, okay, what's going on here? Okay, and why are they speaking in tongues? What is the interpretation? Okay, it's not something that you feel uncomfortable with if someone does speak in tongues in church. Do you just get it? Do I believe it's healthy to speak in tongues in church? I do. I do, but not out loud unless someone interprets. Now, trust me, okay? You need to trust me on Tuesday, maybe I'll do this for you, okay? I'll do this for you on Tuesday. I'll show you. If I start speaking in tongues, okay, now, I'll give it to you in writing. You will start seeing visions. A lot of you will start seeing visions. 
Okay? No. 100%. Because it's interpretation. Okay? Uh, the proper tongues is, and you might not be aware of it, but if I start speaking tongues, I'll do it on Tuesday and show you to you. You just have to close your eyes, and after three, four minutes, you close your eyes, and people who never see visions, or never have like, what, what was that? will start saying. Okay? Because it, it, you directly start receiving interpretation of what I'm saying. You understand? Sometimes I know what I'm saying. Sometimes I don't know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. It's a strange, strange thing. Okay? When I'm, how Fiona and I find this out is, we started praying in tongues together, and so Fiona sometimes is driving, she's not speaking in tongues. And so I'm speaking in tongues in a car. She's driving. And she's like, oh boy, you're speaking in tongues, and I'm seeing. Yeah? So then we realize, oh, this thing works. It's not an individual thing. If, if she's speaking in tongues, I start seeing. So you, just imagine you have a home that someone is constantly praying, praying in tongues. You have a family. Someone in the family is praying in tongues. You see? What happens is people start realizing certain things without even praying in tongues. Do you just get it? Okay? So it's very, very important because tongues is an important aspect. You don't have to speak in tongues, but it's good if someone is speaking in tongues around you because it will help you edify and edify you. Now, I'm going to show you this video, which uh, uh, now science is finding out. That they're doing. You see, neuroscience is an interesting thing. That's why I took it up as my studies. Neuroscience is now being able to, in vivo, inside your brain, check you while you're doing something, yeah? And so all this time, uh, they couldn't do it. But now with all the new um, spec scans and the fMRIs and stuff like that, they can actually check out a person what happens when you're actually praying in tongues, you see? And so I love it because now they've distinguished it. When a person meditates, what happens to a person, okay? What type of meditation they're doing. So there are so many, I mean, this, this time in my, in my module, uh, at King's College, it's mindfulness. So it's really interesting. So it, it's the pathology of mindfulness. Like when you meditate, what goes on? Can you believe they have a whole, they have a whole, uh, let's put it like this, three months set aside for meditation and what happens to the pathology of the brain. So now you have to understand that, that when you meditate, certain things change and shift in a very, very good way in your brain. But now they can do the same in brain or tongues. And guess what? It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. It's a completely different thing. In fact, they say it's the opposite thing. Isn't it cool? It does, it's opposite to what meditation does, okay? In the, uh, the parental lobe here on the left, I won't go into science, one gets deactivated, one gets activated, okay? So do we need to meditate and stay silent? Yes. Meditation is very passive. Tongues is very active. You got it? So it does completely different things. I'm not saying meditation is bad. I meditate myself. But tongues, there's something else. And I, I just want to show you this clip with this... Uh, uh, with this guy who's done some studies, and he just explains three minutes. Can we have it up there? We find linguistics and phonetics, we find health and psychology, we find sociology, creation of typologies, and of course, neuroscience, which is where we are working. There is one landmark study from Andrew Newberg, who analyzed five women from Pentecostal churches, and there he saw that there were activations in praying in tongues in both hemispheres of the brain and uh, reductions in the left hemisphere. Interestingly, Broca and Vernica, which are the language areas, are not involved. So we were actually studying that ourselves and with a sample of 30 participants, 17 females and 13 males, we investigated that ourselves. They were all glossolalics, they were praying in tongues and we were doing MRI research, like brain scans, to see whether the structural brain situation changes. So we looked at the brain structures and not the activities and saw that there are some structural changes in the brain. Now you can do structural brain research or functional brain research and we did a structural brain research. So we were asking do some brain areas change in structure when people pray in tongues? And lay and behold that's what we found. There are two regions that are positively associated with the gray matter. So first we found a positive association with the left frontal pole. This is a region associated with high level executive control, with goal oriented behavior, with multitasking and switching of internal and external attentional control. Interestingly, simultaneous interpreters also show increase in gray matter density and so do our glossolalics. Now we found the same for the right middle frontal gyrus. This is a region responsible for interference, suppression, and response inhibition. Now, this could mean that people have 
glossolalic impulses that are being filtered out by this exact region. Isn't that cool? Come on, yeah, come on, that's really cool. The science now, you see, see, you, 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 that's why I told you I love science. Because when you get into science, you realize the science starts proving who God is. Okay, do you just get it? Yeah? You see, so now they're realizing that they can actually in vivo look at when a person prays in tongues and realizes that it benefits the gray matter. That means in those areas, your gray matter, that means that part of your brain really increases in size. Isn't that cool? And the interesting thing, when it, uh, we talk of the, uh, the, the frontal gyrus, the right middle frontal gyrus, that area of your brain, interestingly, very, very coolly, has to do with mathematics. Okay, that's your math part of, part of the brain. That's where, we, and that's what I realized when I talk in tongues. How many of you have experienced this? When you talk in tongues, after you're speaking, speaking, speaking in tongues for a little while, you'll realize that your pattern recognition becomes really good. Okay, and you'll realize that how, I, how, how when I start prophesying, when I go into the crowd, that I'll stop at a certain place, and then I'll say, this person and that person, these people are connected. You remember I used to say that? Okay, and I'm able to pattern recognize. That means I'm able to understand the maths in the group without a conscious intent. You see, and that area increases. So if you want your children to really study maths, tongues, <laughs> you get it, tongues, yeah. Tongues help, okay? And the very, very interesting part of that, area, the front, middle, frontal gyrus, that area actually is the one that maths connect or the mathematics or the dimensions, the spatial dimensions, okay? Yeah, it's spatial awareness, like exactly where you are, okay, the compass of where you are in life and in everything, every other area, okay, that area of tongues, when it gets affected and it grows, what happens is you know exactly, it feels like you know innately where you are. It's not, it's, you know, it's hard to get lost in every sense of the word. You understand it? It's, it's hard to get lost. It will always bring you to a, to a compass of the maths of where you are in pattern recognizing where you are. So it's directly connected with maths and the body of where you are. Isn't that cool? Now this is very cool to me because let me tell you something when you start, when you understand language, uh, if you look at how language was formed, you'll realize that just imagine before, say this, before this time where actually language was really formed and people started speaking it. If I said, if I tell Fiona, I'm just gonna give you an example. Are you guys okay? Yeah. Too much science, too much geeky stuff. No, are you sure? Yeah. Okay. All right, so you, you see, if it's too much geeky stuff, I, I won't, okay? I mean, people complain about geeky stuff, okay? You see, if you, if you see this phone, okay? And I, now, there was no other language, but I've developed a language between me and Fiona. We've somehow, we, we don't talk at all, okay? We don't know a language. Just imagine this. It is thousands and thousands of years ago. And I realized that every time I say something like, like, tick it up, tick it up, tick it up, or pick it up, pick it up, or something like that, or sounds like that, okay? Fiona picks the phone and gives it to me, okay? Sound, sound. Tick it up, tick it up, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. And if there's a sound like that, she picks the phone up and gives it to me. Just understand. Just understand. What, wouldn't that be cool if I didn't tell my friends, I go to my friends and say, hey, you know what? Every time I make this funny sound, I can get her to pick the phone up. <laughs> Don't you think it'll be like magical? Now think about it for a moment. I'm just gonna show you something. There'll be an aha moment when this happens to you, okay? <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> okay, okay. But take it up, is a, it's not a bad word, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, because tell me, because I don't want to embarrass myself if I'm in front of the world, in front of you guys, it's okay. <laughs> okay, so, okay. Let me say giddy up, okay, giddy up is all. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a horse guy, okay, don't say giddy up, okay. Say, okay, okay. Say no one has heard, I'm trying to change the words so that you understand this, and then you get it. Say no one has heard the word pick it up. Pick it up is nice, okay, it's cute, okay, okay. No one, is, no one knows what ticket up is. No one talks. And then suddenly I realized that if I go up to people and say, ticket up, ticket up, they start picking the phones up. <laughs> then I found something like, dude, these guys are moving according to something I'm saying. Initially, words, remember I told you about every word has a number to it. You see? And they realized that if you put, if you string words together, the nervous system of human being reacts to words. God comes in the form of the word, the logos. Just understand this. So we, if I say, pick it up, she might mistake it as pick it up and pick the phone up and give it to me, okay? If I say Fiona, she, she knows that's her name. Fiona, pick it up. 
Okay, she's not gonna ask questions, she's gonna pick the phone up. Or if it's something, Fiona, take it up. She'll pick it up because it sounds similar. Just I want you to understand how this thing works. It's crazy. And you'll understand a bit about, about a mystic's life. Okay, then I realized, wow, this is what mystics do, they're constantly watching. And so they, I realized, man, this sound makes them pick this thing up, okay? And, but if I go to Spain, but if I go to an India, and I say, take it up, okay, they might do something else. <laughs> I'm a bit worried, okay? <laughs> okay, because I don't know what they'll do because it's not a familiar sound. In fact, the name Fiona will not mean anything to them either. Okay, then I realize that there are patterns that we consciously know, patterns that we unconsciously know that we are moved by when there are certain sounds that are formed. This is how language is formed, okay? Now, just imagine if you, here's the interesting thing, that what happens if English was not your first language? I'm asking you a question. What happens if you, if you reverse 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 8,000, 20,000 years, like in the days of the pyramids, and these guys were communicating in something that was not the language that you know, but it's deeply, deeply ingrained inside of you, which is called spirit, before it reduced. And certain sounds can give you numbers, frequencies, colors, patterns. And what happens if that when I start speaking that language, your ancient beingness rises up to respond to that language, just like Fira picks the phone up. Come on, man. What happens if tongues activate something in you and the person praying at home in tongues and that's why you see visions and somebody you're responding to it because you know it, but not in your human understanding. Come, yeah, that is so cool. Yes, and this, that deserves a bigger shout and a clap than that, yeah. You guys are very hard today, yeah. What happens if there is something that needs to be activated in you that is beyond words? Doesn't words touch you? When someone encourages you, tells you they love you, does it, does it change your life? Doesn't words hurt you? Despite what Winston Churchill said, sticks and stones. Mm -hmm. and words will never hurt me, said, right? But that's not true. Words hurt us all the time. Words encourage us. Words, words make everything happen. What happens if there is something inside of you that is beyond language that is understandable? that activates who you are. And what happens if it changes the, your very, very beingness, including your DNA and every expression, and including putting new brain cells into your body? <laughs> Come on, yes. Yes, what happens? Because they didn't say by eating carrots, you can increase your middle gyrus, frontal, your frontal gyrus. Eating carrots don't do it. Carrots don't do it, guys. Omega-3 doesn't do it, guys. I'm gonna take omega-3, I take omega-3 every day. Very good, you need to take, but omega-3 doesn't do it. What happens, there is something else that is causing you to become that person you are actually supposed to be and the missing link is with the words and the frequencies that come towards you. If words hurt you, if words make you depressed, if watching news makes you sick, then there's something else that you need to hear that you don't need to understand. Yeah. That is activating the nervous system and changing you in your innermost being. Yeah. What happens if God, who created you, knows that and gives it to you as a gift in the New Testament? Come on. Come on. Come on. So you can stay in the bathroom and talk in tongues so that no one else hears, but it might be something that you want to do. <laughs> do you just get it? It might be something that you want to practice. It might be something that you desire because it comes out of desire. Do you just get it? I can give you science and science and science on tongues. Trust me, it's some, one of my favorite subjects. It's something that I do constantly, continuously. It's changed my life. You understand that? Because the Bible says it like this. It is in verse, in, in, in chapter 14. Listen carefully, okay? Listen carefully. So I'm going to give it to you uh, slightly the, and the explanation of prophecy and tongues, okay? No, so chapter 13, verse 1. Chapter 13, verse 1, we go to chapter 14. Chapter 13, verse 1. Listen carefully. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Do you just see that? So, love is the focus here, 
and I don't take away from it, okay? Because there are people who talk in tongues and have no love. So what's the point? Truly, okay? But the focus here is that they knew that there was a tongue of a man and they knew that there was a tongue of a being that is not a man. Right there in your Bible, guys, ladies and gentlemen. There are types of languages. And yes, angels can speak in English, but they rather, like Paul, speak in tongues. Come on. Did you just see that? What happens if speaking in tongues is activating the forces that are against you, towards you? Speaking in tongues are causing beings and angels to reconcile with you. What happens in speaking in tongues are causing supernatural unseen entities to work for you. Because if you know the language of a lion, then a lion listens to you. And uh, my, my father-in-law used to uh, go to the golf club and used to see all these guys who maybe, you know, my dad, my father-in-law came from what they call old money. And so he would see all these, what he calls new rich. My, my father-in-law was okay with, uh, with calling people different categorizing and profiling. That was, uh, that was to do. I don't do it, but he used to, okay? And he would say, all these guys are making so much money. And he would go to the golf club and just sit and wait. And he would go there for, for his beers and his friends, okay? He was not a man of tongues or prayer. Okay, but his prayer would work whenever he prayed, okay? He didn't play in English. No, plain English works as well, trust me, okay? But he would see these guys who talk in Japanese. And they would come to the golf club, and they would sit and wait, and they would only talk in Japanese. But they were, for him, new rich. And they would make more money. But the only reason they would do that is because they spoke Japanese. And Japs play golf. Talk to Eric of coming to Sri Lanka, and the fame you can get if a Sudda starts speaking Sinhalese. Yeah. Come on, give me a big hand. He's there right now. <laughs> Come on. You see? If you speak the language of a lion, you attract lions. If you speak in the language of tigers, you attract tigers, the right type of tigers. <laughs> If you speak in the language of dragons, you attract dragons. You understand that? You see, different beings have different languages. You have a different language, am I correct? Okay. This man and I are gonna pray for you if you're sick today. Trust me, he has anointing for healing. He mentioned on his wife, come on. If you're sick, but I, I'm telling you, you're gonna get healed. Arusha is unbelievable, Arusha and Chanel, they have amazing, amazing miracles and testimonies of healing. And I'm going to pray for you today, okay? Yeah, you're going to pray. You take my place and pray. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Okay, now, you see, guys, if you speak in the language of angels, you will attract angels. They can talk English. Japanese can talk English, okay? But they rather speak their own language. Do you just get it? Yeah? I can speak English, but I love when Eric speaks Sinhalese. Do you just see it? Because it touches my heart. You're like, wow, this guy wants to know me. It showed that you want to know them. Okay, verse 14. So he goes on about love. Verse two, chapter 14, verse two. For he who speaks in, in a tongue does not speak again to men but to God. Is it there? You got it again. Okay, I mean, we like, God can talk English. He can talk Sinhalese. He can talk all languages. Okay, but talking in this place. Now, now guys, you might think, oh my God, this is overwhelming because I don't talk in tongues. Don't worry. I'm saying this to you because it's your, I believe, your first language. Your spiritual. If they say that after the pyramids, after that era, it's when language came to man, and this is scientific today, you'll see that there was hieroglyphics before written language, okay? And before hieroglyphics, so we're talking 8,000 years, you say, I am, uh, 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 Melissa is a, uh, what is she called? She's a, what do you, anthropologist, yeah, thank you, yeah. Yeah, Melissa is an anthropologist, you can ask her, okay? So you, she'll tell you that language is maybe about 10,000, say, say 25,000, but they say, Written language is less than 10,000 years. What, the, what were we doing before? Think about it, okay? There were, there were, your first language is God language. 
and it's not the language that you are speaking. So when you want to talk in your first language, you need to be able to go beyond the English, okay? And how many of you have gone, who have been so frustrated with life or something, and you've gone to a place where no one can hear you and you just want to shout? Come on, has anyone felt it? Come on, you just, I'm, just, I'm so frustrated. I just want to go to a place where no one can hear me and I just want to shout. Yeah. Come on, how many have done that? Yes. Can I have a good shout now? Okay, one, two, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. three. Yeah. Come on, yes, yes. Did you see that right there? Did I change something? Yes. That's what you do at a cricket match, <laughs> right? What, does, what is that inside of you? It's not English. And that's why I named Wow Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. wow is not English. Wow is not English. Wow is named after the uh, Hebraic letter Wav, which they call, in, Americans call it Wav, but it's actually Wow. Six, okay? It means it's a nail that plugs you into the earth. It's the down, down, and the up, up, the nail that connects you. Come on, man. Okay, that's wow. Okay, so wow, the name wow is a sound, is an expression. When people are amazed, I'm blown away, it's like wow, everyone says it. But it's not English, wow is not English. Wow is said in Tamil and, and every language you can imagine. They say wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Like the Hebraic word for woman is Isha. And so in Sinhala, we say Shah. <laughs> Shah is not a language. It's an expression of the soul to something beautiful. Isha. You got it? Wow is not a language. And so when you shouted, what did you feel like? Come on, tell me, come on. Come on, some of you shout, some of you here shouted for the first time after a long time. <laughs> You're in school? and you just shouted, Daddy, what did you feel like? Come on, tell me. Free, exhilarated. What happens if you can string up those shouts into sentences? Oh. Yes. <laughs> and the Bible calls it groaning and moaning that cannot be uttered. Yeah. Why do we need to pray in English? Because there's so much more I want to say. When you pray, you pray mysteries. Can you have it up there? Okay. You pray tongues in this understanding, your life changes, okay? Can we have it up there? So it says, this is what it says, for he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to God. Wow, did you get it? Yeah? Men, but to God. For no one understands him. You see, he speaks mysteries in the spirit. He speaks mysteries. Come on, come on, come on. He speaks mysteries, okay? No, no one understands him, and that's cool. No one is supposed to understand you, okay? No one is supposed to, and we're going to get back there, and I'll, I'll close with that, but I want, to, I want to show this good church culture, okay? Good church culture does it like this. So, verse 18. Verse 18, wow, yeah. Verse 18, I thank my God. Verse 14, chapter 14, verse 18. I thank my God, I speak with tongues, but then you all, is it there? I speak with tongues, but then you all, right? Yet in church, I would rather speak five words of understanding. Is it there? Okay, let's watch, watch verse 23. Therefore, if the whole church come together in one place, okay, and all speak with tongues, and there comes in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, listen carefully, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Hello, 2,000 years ago, they had the same problem they're having today. <laughs> That's why when people start talking in tongues, I said, camera's off. Tuesday, camera's gonna be off. Okay, we're gonna talk in tongues. Camera's off, okay? Because they're gonna think you're crazy. Because they're so used to hearing something they can understand. So good church culture protects the congregation from people thinking that you're nuts. That's a good pastor. That's okay that they think I'm nuts. <laughs> Okay, because I, that, that I openly do. Sometimes when I prophesy, I need to speak in tongues. But I don't want to think that, them to think that you're mad. Because you got to be sane. The sane people listen to the mad one. <laughs> Amen. Pastor Neil goes, Amen. One guy in the house. <laughs> you see, because if they see you talking tongues out there, they're going to think that you're mad. Now, that is really in the Bible, guys. 
that is really in the Bible, but how many pastors really practice this stuff? We go to, I have 600 churches. None of them, they're all praying in tongues. The worship sandwich and they're praying in tongues, everyone is praying in tongues. Come on, how, do you, how many of you know this? And so unbelievers go there and like, what the heck is going on here? That's okay to think like that. You are okay to believe like that. We are supposed to protect you from you thinking like that. Did you just get it? Yeah. But if someone wants him to speak in tongues, don't go and stop him. Okay? What you need to see is whether there's an interpretation for that tongue. Okay? And someone in the congregation will have it. Okay, now here, here it is. Okay, we're going to go back to this. Okay, we're going back to 14 and we, we, we stop here. Okay, verse 2. Tuesday is going to be a workshop in this. Okay, yeah. And if you've never spoken in tongues and you want to, then come. And don't worry, camera's going to be off. Okay, and I'm going to show you what you can do with tongues. And it's really, it gets really, really interesting. Okay, now, for he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to God. Is it there? For no one understands him. Is it there? No one understands. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Do you just see there? He speaks mysteries. Okay. So this is what you need to understand. Okay. Now, this is, this is what really, really blew me away about tongues. And it's something that why I recommend that if there's anyone who has a desire for this, that they need to speak in tongues. This mysteries thing is very interesting. It means that God is looking for a mouth, a nervous system, to inhabit the earth through. God is spirit. God, God can be touched. He needs an earthen vessel. He means a body. That's why Jesus Christ came, God came into a body. He needs an incarnation so that he can walk, talk, eat chocolate, drive Ferraris, hopefully, or Tatas, or whatever it is, or Trishaws, it doesn't matter, okay? God has not driven a Trishaw before until he's in you driving it, okay? So he's, he's looking for a human experience, okay? Just understand, this God is incarnating Looking for this human experience through you, okay? And interestingly, without your tongue, without you touching, if you don't, if Arosha didn't turn up today to lay hands on you for healing, then God can't move. Think about that for a moment when you are dealing with God. God needs to move through human beings. The Christian God moves through human beings. The Christian God doesn't move sovereignly. He is sovereign, chosen to move through men. That's why Jesus of Nazareth is God. That's why you believe the man is God. That's good theology. If you believe that God can come summaringly and do something beyond the human mouth and a body, it's not Christianity, it's some other religion. Do you just get it? God will always come in an earthen vessel. That's why he's misunderstood. Our God is broken on the cross, dying to show his humanity. <laughs> You just get it. So when you're a Christian, you believe God comes in the flesh. Without controversy, this is what the Bible says. It says it without controversy, God manifests in the flesh. You see? Now, understanding that, here's the interesting thing. I always keep saying this to people, and I, they don't get it till something like this happens, like tongues happen. Because when you start speaking tongues, you'll realize something. And we speak tongues maybe over maybe 15 minutes. It's hard first, okay? We'll get it going, okay? After a little while, you realize that you're praying for certain things and you start seeing visions. And you realize that the visions that you're seeing has nothing to do with you. But you're thinking of something else. You're thinking of, I'm going to pray for Pastor Neil today. Okay? And I'm praying in tongues more and more and more. Okay? I'm praying in tongues more. Okay? And now I'm passionate. I'm seeing a vision. I'm thinking I'm praying for Pastor Neil. But it's about... Donald Trump. I'm like, why am I seeing Donald Trump? Okay. And why am I seeing the police situation with Donald Trump? Now, you may be very upset that God loves Donald Trump. Uh. But, <laughs> but that's exactly what I'm trying to say. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm trying to say. God needs someone to pray. But if you tell you to pray for Donald Trump, you will not be praying for Donald Trump. Because you don't like him. Uh. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. A yielded heart dreams the dreams of God. It's not a selfish thing. It's a yielded heart. And so when you're talking in tongues, he uses you because you're yielded to pray even for your enemies. Yes. Even for the ones that, the areas that you, that you don't know that you need to pray for. Yes. There is so much of stuff that is stuck because of your judgment. Come on, man. Because of the way you accuse. 
because the way you dislike. So when you yield your prayer to God, he uses your tongue to pray for those you don't even know or don't even care for, but he dreams for. Did you just get it? So unless you experience this and you realize that God has bigger plans than you, my friend. When you're talking about your finances, when you're talking about your healing, believe me, there are other people that need healing. Maybe if you pray for them, maybe you'll get healed. And therefore, tongues are given to you so that you pray the mysteries of God. Mysteries mean things that you will not know how to pray for. Do you just get it? It's, it is, and then he goes on to explain that tongues is a perfect prayer. Why is it a perfect prayer? Because of this very reason I gave you. I'm going to tell you something really, really interesting. That middle gyrus, the gray matter when it increases. They've done studies on this. It's the same area when it decreases that people have mental sickness, especially bipolar, schizophrenia. Okay, the same area of the brain that affects schizophrenia. If the gray matter increases, it heals mental sicknesses. Now that is the latest study that we're done in 2020, okay, on tongues and where it affects the brain. I'm sure God understood this stuff, that when we pray with our own language, the first language, when we pray in the spirit that he had purposed us to pray in, that we get healed. I'm sure he knew that when he gave it. This is a thousand and thousand, thousands of year old study. Okay, this is not something new. This is what people used thousands of years ago, tongues, which now has come to you again in the New Testament as something that you can use powerfully and we should not be embarrassed about it. Science is just finding out what we have known for thousands of years and I'm glad for it. You get it? Now, how many of you, I will, I'll, I'll end with this last one. So we can bring the dream team up. Okay. But he who prophesies, okay, verse two, for he who speaks in tongues, does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But listen carefully now. Dream team, come up. But he who prophesies, do you see there? But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So what do we do in church? Tongues or prophecy? Prophecy. You get it? But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in tongues edifies, strengthens himself. If you need to be strengthened, speak in tongues. If your life needs to be changed, speak in tongues. If you need finances, speak in tongues. You understand that? But when you're speaking to someone else, interpret those tongues so that it can be for someone else. But he who edifies, prophesies, edifies the church. Do you just get it?